so there are two, well, two questions. One is what is structural transformation? Which countries have experienced this? And uh, how does it relate to growth, productivity, and, uh, and, and development? Um, and I think on, the, on, on this particular sort of this first question, um, there, were, was a there were a range of answers. Um, so first of all, I think we, he we heard from Maggie uh, talking about the data that, uh, that there has been some structural change happening. And there has been productivity change, looking at the countries that she um, that she looked at, um, but there were also some some uh, discussion on f from the various speakers on. Well, yes, there has been structural change, but maybe not always the ones the types of that we really are interested in. So Nick was talking about the lack of uh, of employment uh, uh, employment uh, generation in, uh, in structural transformation. So there has been a transformation, but it has been has been employment uh, employment intensive. Um, uh, Andres was talking about the, um, uh, the problems uh, with, with the agrarian transition that it also left a lot a lot behind and you looked at transformation in, this, in another another way growth plus, uh, plus depth and I think that um, um, that there isn't necessarily um, um, uh, one particular way to, to look at structural transformation other than to say well we all agree that uh, that that structural transformation is something related to a type of growth that is broad based and that is also long lasting so that it's long lasting and that it doesn't that you just don't uh, have natural resources boom now and that, it, that you don't s sow seeds for uh, for future uh, future development so something that is long lasting is, is is a very important part so productivity change uh, sort of which is the key uh, a key focus of uh, of the GDRP um, is 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 one uh, uh, one key focus that we um, that is really important in in structural transformation and then about the second question about um, how how uh, do countries uh, transform structurally what are the characteristics um, I think here there was a wide range of discussion I can't I can't really summarize that um, uh, other than to say that that uh, we're all emphasize governance state capacity and I think we're all um, or two at least two of you here at the table emphasized uh, uh, st uh, working with companies so you, you in terms of supplier development and also you have some examples about the, uh, the beers mm -hmm. um, and also the shoe uh, the shoe uh, uh, cluster um, where where uh, working together between the state and, uh, and business for for uh, for transformation is uh, is an important element what I propose to do is, is open up to the floor uh, to the floor for questions and um, uh, there should be a microphone uh, there uh, going around so if you could speak in the microphone and introduce yourself uh, briefly and then make a point or or, or or a question and then I will hand back to the panel uh, so let's take a couple of questions who, who would like to start uh, Michael I'm Michael Lipton I am a an agricultural economist and development economist from the University of Sussex I very much enjoy these fascinating presentations thank you um, I'd like to raise some basic statistical issues. Before we ask, is growth inclusive or pro-poor, can we be sure what is happening, reasonably sure, in sub-Saharan Africa? Take the statement of 5% per year compound growth of GDP in sub-Saharan Africa. Well, according to the World Development Indicators, saving in sub-Saharan Africa is well below what is required to replace the depreciation of ordinary physical capital plus minerals. And if you allow for that, the remaining growth of GDP per person per year is 1.6% per head through the uh, 19, sorry, th from 2000 to 2011, which incidentally is a very respectable rate and a big improvement. But let's not say there's a growth miracle here if that is the fact. Um, and much of that is growth in Nigerian oil. Um, the second thing I want to raise on exactly the same range of issues, namely knowing what the data mean, is are the GDP data of a sufficient quality for us to say the things that we are saying and for us to engage in complicated statistical exercises based on them? Do we really know what smallholder subsistence output is? In how many African countries do we have some good idea of that? Similarly for informal sector output. And if we don't know what's really happening to GDP in sub-Saharan Africa or in parts of sub-Saharan Africa, especially some of the very large countries, should we not say so and prioritize doing something about it? I was very interested to hear about DHS and the attempts to use DHS in this respect. DHS is a wonderful resource and useful for many things, but is it a random sample? Can it tell us if growth is happening on a nationwide basis? I mean, all these things, I think, need to be addressed. When we talk about growth of productivity, are we talking about single-factor productivity or total-factor productivity? 
if we are talking about total factor productivity, is it really all that important? Obviously, it's important. But we want employment to get up from the very low levels, mm. from the high levels of unemployment that we see in many sub-Saharan African mm. countries. And homing in on total factor productivity may not be the right way to do that. So I'd just like to, I've got other points, but the one point I want to <laughs> emphasize now is, do we need to see much more emphasis in the early stages of this product in get on getting our measurements right before we make a very elaborate and intellectually beautiful structure that actually doesn't have a substructure in usable numbers. <laughs> Brilliant. Very good. Thanks for that. Um, who would like to uh, to go next? Otherwise, we'll um, we'll we'll we'll. Oh, Stephanie. Stephanie Griffith Jones is also a DGOP grant holder. Yes, I'm. Uh, as, as Dirk said, I, I have a grant on on the financial sector, um, and I'm also an advisor to the DGRP. Um, so I, I very much enjoyed the presentations and uh, and Dirk's final comments. I wanted first to, I wanted to ask um, nobody actually mentioned the opportunities which I think uh, Sub-Saharan Africa is gaining from the fact that uh, a lot of natural uh, resources are being discovered, mineral resources in particular. And as you colleague your answer, the chief economist said, he said nicely puts it. What can be done uh, to make this not a resource curse, but a resource blessing? That is, what are the macro, institutional, and other arrangements that can actually lead for this to enable structural uh, transformation and inclusive growth? And I think also there hasn't been so much discussion, although there have been so many interesting uh, points raised about how um, the state, which has been rather depleted, I think, in sub-Saharan Africa uh, by crises in the past and by structural transformation, could develop uh, in a modern way, not necessarily in the way it was done in the past, um, policy instruments that would enable it to support the private sector to have this structural transformation. Because it's all very nice to plan, to talk about what sectors you should go into, but you need kind of instruments, policy instruments. And I think um, African economies, and uh, indeed others as well, don't have enough enough instruments. One that I'm very keen on is, is development banks, good development banks, well-functioning. But there can be many others. There can be other kinds of mechanisms um, that can um, channel, help channel resources towards uh, sectors that, that can grow more, that can generate more jobs, that are more inclusive. And just one final point, if I may, about um, Nick's very interesting presentation. He made a point about how elites could be against growth uh, because they had vested <coughs> interests. But I think we can also think about elites as they have done, um, say, in Latin America, which I know better. Um, they tend to adjust. So the same families that had companies in uh, agriculture and minerals then go into industry, mm -hmm. go into other sectors. So uh, elites are not, I think, themselves always um, um, an obstacle, they can actually lead trans mm. structural transformation. Very good. Um, th in the meantime, there's one question that has come in um, on my iPad, uh, which I'll, I'll read up, and it, which is to, to Andres from Laurent, uh, Laurence, or Lawrence in Rugby, UK. If smallholders are, go are going to expand to the extent of structurally transforming South Africa, then surely this cannot occur without land reform, redistribution. Mm. Um, very good. Um, and the gentleman over there. <coughs> my name's my name's Keith Palmer. I'm an investor in agriculture in Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, I, I recognise completely the uh, the analysis that Nick Lee spoke about, and the uh, the consequences of the um, of the commodity price boom and the overvaluation of the exchange rate. Something he didn't say, though, which we, Sorry, also, observe, a bit? Uh, we also observe very closely, is that uh, the boom in non-traded goods sector is uh, inflating the cost of managerial resources and entrepreneurial resources and sucking them out of the other sectors, particularly agriculture. So the consequence is that experience management, which is needed to make commercial agriculture work better in the rural areas for the benefit of smallholders 
is simply too expensive for agriculture to be commercially viable. And there's a dynamic that says the, the boom in the service sector is causing uh, reduced competitiveness of traded goods in the, in the rural areas in, in particular. All right, very good. Um, if there's no question, then uh, then we'll go to to the um, uh, to the panel. So there are questions about uh, about data, in particular uh, from from Michael Lipton. There are questions about um, uh, turning a resource boom into a um, uh, into a, a blessing for countries. Resource into a blessing. What are the factors behind this? Um, um, uh, think a bit more about uh, the types of policies that are needed uh, for, uh, for for doing this. Uh, something on inclusive growth and employment, and the last question about um, uh, uh, about linkages between sectors. Um, what I'd like to do is to go to each uh, each uh, member of the panel um, in turn. Uh, Nick, uh, are you still online? I am. Yes. Yes. Would you like to come in? Y yes. Sure. Pleasure. Pleasure. Um, uh, uh, before I before I um, have a crack at an, uh, at a, an answer, could could I just quickly say something um, to Maggie? In that um, I, uh, I I don't wish to give the the uh, impression that I don't think any structural transformation is happening in Africa at all. I think um, Maggie's completely right that there are some cases where some um, some really exciting structural transformation is happening. I'm always very excited to go to Uganda, and um, and I'm also um, excited by what's happening in Ethiopia. So I wasn't at all uh, attempting to characterise every Afri African economy with um, with doom and gloom. I was just saying that there is there is a rump where which is, is very very hard to shift. Um, yes. the, um, the, um, some of the questions I think on the measurement question this is so topical at the moment um, after the bad data book as well. Um, uh, I was um, I'm very careful uh, particularly about cross country analysis and um, to uh, uh, and whenever I look at countries, I spend a lot of time doing triangulation, creative triangulation, I call it. Um, so um, you, you don't just rely on your formal data sources, which, as you say, um, there's all sorts of reasons which could be all over the place. But you, you um, constantly make hypotheses, and then you try and triangulate those with things that you can see. Um, I remember uh, looking for evidence of rural booms um, through... Uh, through looking at corrugated iron imports in Malawi, which was uh, one fascinating way to triangulate um, whether tobacco income had gone to uh, to, to, to rural income. So um, I think um, as economists we have to be um, we have to be very forensic and very practical um, when it comes to drawing conclusions about what's really going on, on the ground for precisely the reason that Michael Lipton is uh, pointing out. Um, uh, Stephanie asked the question about how can you make a, a resource curse a resource blessing. Um, for me, the best answer is um, um, Collier's custody principle. Um, that um, you 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 try to ensure that net assets, net um, natural assets and uh, physical assets remain constant. So if you take a million dollars of gold out of the ground, you replace it with a million dollars of roads or a million dollars of ports or uh, um, I suppose, like more contentiously, a, a million dollars worth of educated um, uh, population. Um, so there is something about um, trying to maintain the balance of assets in your economy, um, so that it, you're managing natural resources in the long-term interests of the population rather than the short-term uh, interests of, of the people digging out. Um, I think there's also um, uh, some some tips about being careful about your non-tradable industries that um, if you are um, if you have got a resource which is uh, a very very high value resource then uh, you may not be able to diversify into competitive light manufacturing exports um, instead you might be forced to look at your own non-tradables and to try and make those as competitive as possible um, because when the resource exhausts um, you will need a basis of a non-tradable industry um, in order to build up a, a diversified export. I mean, obviously, diversify exports wherever you possibly can, but sometimes it's phenomenally difficult. Um, and then uh, about uh, the leaching of the service sector from the agricultural sector, I hadn't heard that before, but I, I think that's entirely probable. That's very, very interesting. 
All right, thank you very much. Um, we now turn to, uh, to three minutes each for the, to the other grant uh, or to the grant holders, and then then we promise we have uh, we have drinks. So if you if you allow us to uh, to, to run over by about uh, eight minutes, please, uh, Maggie. Hi. Um, um, thanks for the questions and the interest. Uh, of course, the data issues. Yes, with that that infamous book by now um, are, are front and center. But I totally agree with what Nick said. I mean, we have to be. <laughs> forensic data analysts and the DHS are nationally representative and that's one of the reasons why I'm using them and the exciting thing is that um, they're actually not that different I'm, I'm, I'm the results I'm finding are not all that different from what I I say macro data lots of the macro data are based on um, labor force and household surveys and by the way it's not it's not always the case that the data are bad, but it's, it's sometimes the way we use the data. You know, people don't pay attention to the way the questions are asked, for example, or, or so and so. There's a lot that can be done with what we already have, although I did emphasize in my grant the need for more data collection, my grant proposal. And then on, on the commodity prices, I think I did say something about, um, you know, the commodity boom and using that um, as a, as a platform for structural transformation, but I may have used, I may have said that in the other talk, but, but l let me just be more clear. So um, I, I think there's huge scope for um, for um, using the increases, in, the, the increased commodity prices for job creation and so forth. I mean, that um, Ethiopia is just one example, but uh, there's a big story uh, about this Nigerian, this a very wealthy Nigerian businessman who plans to start uh, producing oil for the local market and to exporting it to, to other countries. I, and there's also a recent paper by um, uh, the, um, the political, so Jim Robinson at Harvard, he did a paper for me for the African Economic Outlook this year on basically, the, I think the title is Harnessing Natural Resources for Structural Change. And he talks a lot about the institutional arrangements that, that um, that need to be need to be in place in order for the commodity price boom to benefit small people. And uh, he talks about how the, the commodity price boom was the basis for industrialization in the Western world. <coughs> and um, Francis, I just wanted to plug Francis, if you don't mind. I just wanted to say that um, the African Center for An Economic Transformation and, and Francis they'll be presenting their African tre Transformation Report at a conference that we're hosting together in Nairobi in, on December 5th and 6th. I hope you don't mind, Francis. No, no, no. It's a, very, it's a great report. I'm very excited about it. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Maggie. Um, Andres. Yeah, just a couple of uh, words in response to the question. Um, um, and the, text, the, the question was, if smallholders are going to explain to the extent of structurally transforming South Africa, uh, I don't think that's what I don't think that's possible, and I don't think that's what I'm advocating. Uh, I think what South Africa needs in the long run is decent non-farm jobs in the rural and urban se sectors as well. I think uh, the more I think about smallholder development in South Africa, I think it is part of a safety net. Um, it is a vital part of how poor rural and urban people survive in the context of large-scale joblessness, etc. So I, I just want to make that point clear. Certainly, if smallholder development of any kind is going to take off, we do, we will need land reform. And in South Africa, we're going to have to move on the debate from land reform from its current very sort of static look at we want so m such, a such and such a percentage of the land redistributed by such and such a date. The real question about land reform in South Africa is where? Um, there are so certain parts of the country where we have many, many poor rural people, uh, significant amounts of, of available land, often not very productively used, and nearby markets. That's where you can have land reform. In other parts of the country, you're going to have to find other, other solutions. Um, the, the, the issue that we have in South Africa is that the debate about Land reform happens in two registers. It happens in a socio-economic register about rural livelihoods, but it's also it is, uh, in, in an indirect discussion of the national question, of the colonial question of whose country does this, is this really? And as long as these two debates are tangled up with one another, it's very difficult to make uh, decent policy headway. Brilliant, thank you. 
Uh, Francis, you yeah. have the last word. Sure. Uh, well, I'll focus to one of the questions that was raised regarding um, policies uh, for making uh, the resource, the natural resource um, sort of a, uh, uh, sector beneficial, or at least to reduce sort of this curse. Um, well, at ASSET, in addition to doing research, we also do policy advisory, where we work with African governments to actually um, develop policies uh, toward transformation. Uh, so we're involved with this country, um, which is signing a big mining contract. And, uh, you know, when we talk about mining, we mostly focus on the fiscal, um, sort of fiscal regimes. Uh, sort of uh, ro royalty and so on and so forth and how the government should use that money to uh, to f sort of make it long lasting <coughs> or to benefit to the people. But we, d we seldom pay attention to sort of the procurement opportunities that um, are available in these projects. We're talking about billions and billions of dollars. But a lot of that are outsourced mm. to foreign companies mm. who don't have any activities at all in the country. Yeah. So what we're doing with uh, this specific country, we're actually looking at the procurement opportunities and trying to tell the country, okay, l identify businesses, local businesses in your country and um, tell this company to tell its pr prospective bidders for these procurement opportunities to join <coughs> venture with these locals. I mean, not necessarily to give them the full amount of the projects, but at least to give them a taste of this, uh, this, uh, these activities. And over the long run, these local businesses should be able to sort of, uh, you know, bid by themselves. I mean, some of the, the bidding are, you know, buying boots, you know, headsets, I mean, uh, uh, protective, protective gears. These are very basic items, which pretty much any small business can do. But of course, the idea, the question is just doing it in a large scale. and. Once you do that, uh, that can also reduce some of the, I mean, it will create huge amount of jobs. It will also sort of be the basis for uh, a local light manufacturing sector in the country. So these are some of the, the things that one can do to help at least uh, sort of uh, attenuate sort of this resource, I mean, at least the pr probabil pr probability of a resource curse. All right, thank you very much. Um, so I hope you found this a very uh, stimulating and interesting uh, discussion, and I did at least. Um, uh, this was, we've discussed st structural transformation. It's uh, an old debate, but it's, uh, it's coming back onto the, uh, to the academic agendas, as we've heard, but also the, the policy agendas, and I'm very, uh, very, uh, very pleased about that. Um, and I'm very pleased that the DODRP is going to, uh, to contribute uh, to, to that. And uh, uh, on the website um, uh, of, of the DODRP, there are already a couple of uh, publications there which you can download as well. So there's something on state business relations and industrial policy. It includes the work by, uh, by Maggie and, uh, and, and Danny Roderick and some and, and others. Uh, we've got something on finance for development. And soon there will also be a, a set of essays uh, edited with Stephanie Griffith-Jones uh, on, uh, on what does it take uh, to to create a st stable and efficient financial sector for structural transformation. Um, so we'll, you'll be able to hear more um, on this. But let me also thank uh, some of the people involved. Uh, uh, and if you want to hear more, so there's also some, but Dan Coble there is from the ESRC. He, uh, he sits there. So if you have questions on the ESRC, ask, ask him there. Uh, there are a number of, um, uh, of people here who help us on the communication side. Uh, so Caroline and Sarah are over there. But let us think also to uh, thank the speakers, of course. Nick, on the, Nick Lee on the telephone and Maggie McMillan from, uh, uh, in the US. Thank you very much. And Andres uh, here and Francis as well. Thank you very much for this presentation. And let's um, uh, join together uh, next door for, uh, for a drink. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thanks.